Hello again, Cape Cod. I'm Greg Anderson. It was in November of 2022 that those of us on the Cape and Islands got a brand new district attorney. The longtime reign of a Republican stronghold of that office was over. Democrat Rob Galliboy stepped in, and what a ride it's been for him since then. A mix of good, not so good. It it's kind of part of the job. We're going to take a look inside the Cape and Island District Attorney's office, talking to him next. That's today's takeaway. As the summer unfolds, the beaches are open, the smell of lobster and suntan lotion fill the salty air here on Cape Cod, a wonderful time of year here on the Cape, but we also live in a world of crime and we turn to those in public safety and the law to protect us. So what's happening these days on the Cape and islands with drugs, human trafficking and domestic violence and cyberbullying, something that's hitting sandwich pretty close to home right now. On today's takeaway, Cape and Islands District Attorney Rob Gallivoice, welcome back, my friend. Thank you so much for the invite. Great to see you again, Greg. So it's been a long time. It's been coming up on two years. Two yeah. years. Tempest how's, Fugit. How's it been? How's it uh, been? Outstanding. Uh, as I, I mentioned to you, I think last time I got to see you was this was a professional dream of mine for about 20 plus years. And I can honestly say with a straight face, I'm living the dream. All right. I like that. So when you came in to, when we last talked and you were running for office, yes. uh, there were a lot of initiatives and goals that you had. Yes. Take me through some of the ones that are, you know, jumping out at you right now. You sure. want to share, because one thing you did say is you wanted to open up a lot more transparency yes. from your office to the public. So yes. be as transparent. Give me some of the highlights. So um, your viewers might remember um, I talked about uh, the history of the office, the Cape and Islands DA's office created in 1974 by Phil Rollins. And um, I explained that over the course of time from 1974 to 2022, back then, um, 48 years, there had never been a woman that was the first assistant, that is the top prosecutor, the person that's basically in charge of the entire caseload as well as the entire employee base. And uh, the very first thing I did, Greg, when I was sworn in on January 4th, 2023, was I appointed Jessica Lumba to be my first assistant. Uh, Jess arrived having a career of about 20, 22 years working as a career prosecutor uh, for Bristol County, Plymouth County, and the Attorney General's Office. Hmm. She had handled the most serious cases, uh, approximately 20 homicides at that particular point. So she was extremely well qualified, and I was extremely excited to be able to appoint her as the first woman, first assistant district attorney in the history of the Cape and Islands. Um, something I was very proud of. Yeah. Two other things that I just want to briefly mention yeah, was please. Um, going across the Cape and the Islands, there were two issues that I thought resonated everywhere. And the first had to do about mental health. Um, to remind your viewers, at that time, we were the only part of the state that didn't have a mental health court. Uh, it existed in counties across the Commonwealth, but not here. Mm. And um, what a mental health court is, our professionals in the field come in and they literally deal directly with the defendant to try to identify what's the core issue that this person's struggling with. And when you do that, you make that identification, of course you can address it and reduce recidivism, uh, making us all safer. So we're so happy and excited that uh, Judge John Julian, um, he's the presiding judge in Barnstable, uh, he opened up a, a mental health court, I believe it was last September of 2023, uh, and we appreciate his leadership in this area. Judge Teresa Wright is the judge that presides over the session. And we were asked as an office, um, would you consider appointing a prosecutor to be the lead, if you will, in this mental health court session? Uh, I asked the staff, a woman by the name of Sh uh, Shauna Suve, raised her hand very quickly. She has her bachelor's degree uh, in psychology, um, and she happens to uh, uh, be from Barnstable, lifelong resident, and her dad's a Barnstable police officer. Uh, so she, we appointed her to be our mental health prosecutor. So that, that's incredibly exciting. Where do people come into that part of the the judicial s system, if you will? Mm -hmm. um, is it is it after a, uh, there's a, a a crime and mental health needs to be assessed? How do, what's yes. the pecking order of process? Not pecking sure. order. Sure. So um, when someone is charged with a crime and there is an indication that mental health might be an issue here, um, I know the judge. 
our prosecutor, probation, and case workers and, and professionals in the field, they have, I believe it's every other week, meetings, kind of like a screening process, if you will. Okay. So um, if the attorney brings it to our attention that this is someone that might qualify for admission in the mental health court, or if it's just picked up by the probation department as in the early stages, um, then we screen it, and if we feel that the services are available to treat this particular person, then they're screened in, if you will. Okay. Um, the one other area that, I, if I yeah. could just highlight, yeah. was the second issue that resonated everywhere was the need for deeper community engagement by the DA's office in the communities that we served. A lot of people were unfamiliar with what the DA's office did and didn't really know many people in the DA's office. And I spoke at that time, Greg, of creating a brand new position called the Community Engagement Officer. Um, we were able to do that. Her name is Kelly Queeley. Uh, she's also a lifelong resident of Barnstable and uh, been in the office about 12 years before we appointed her to this position. And I charged her with a task, her initial task, is again something I spoke about in the campaign, is creating these uh, community coalitions. And there's gonna be a chapter in every single town, we gave it a cute name called the DA and Us, mm -hmm. and there's gonna be one on each island. And what it is, is um, we're asking everyday citizens, folks that have never engaged in civic work in their life, to join this coalition, along with some local elected officials, and it just allows us to keep our finger on the pulse of what's going on in a particular community. Um, a person in our office made the keen observation, when you look at Cape Cod from a satellite, you see one Cape Cod. But as we know down here, we have 15 different towns, yeah. so you have at least 15 different DA's offices, and so many of the towns have separate villages that a lot of people like to identify themselves from certain villages. Yeah. So having been in office now only about 17 months, I've already noticed, over here I may have an uptick in fraud cases uh, with the elderly. And over here it might be hate incidents in schools. And over here it might be the op opioid crisis. So we're looking to meet quarterly, each coalition mm -hmm. meet quarterly uh, and share with us what's going on in your particular village or town. And that's just another resource that we get, have to identify what's going Has on. Has it already started? Yes, we actually had our very first meeting uh, with Wellfleet. Wellfleet was first up. Okay. Um, and I think we have five members on, on that particular community coalition. Uh, I know, I'm pretty certain the sandwich has already been scheduled. Um, Kelly Queeley is in charge. And we're looking to staff them, about half a dozen people to a dozen, uh, depending on the size of the town. Um, okay. And we've got some really, great agenda items to start to launch it. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, so this, so Kelly's position mm -hmm. is, is really, she's not a legal person. No, she's, she's not an attorney. Correct. It's kind of a, a community relations, a community liaison, yes. if, if you will. Yes. Because um, you really felt there was a backlog of, there's a lot of stuff happening in the DA's office, but mm -hmm. no one really knew about it. Yes. What, what have you learned uh, about the way things were from your constituents? Um, there was certainly some great staff members uh, in the office before I arrived, and, and I retained them, uh, and specifically in the area of uh, community outreach. Uh, the director of my community programs, her name is Danielle Whitney. She happens to be a Sandwich resident. Many people, I think, will recognize her name. Yeah. Um, and she is outstanding. Uh, she really cares about all of the communities across the Cape. Uh, and she's been working now for, um, I think, more than 15 years. So she's fairly well recognized. What does she do again? She is the director of my community programs. Got it. Um, she works very closely with a, a whole host of stakeholders across the community, from your schools to your recovery world professionals, things of that sort. Um, and I was very appreciative that she was willing to kind of take on more of a role with me because she's understanding that I wanted to add to her staff. Um, I was actually asked once, it was a, question, it was a great question, uh, at an event that, what does the perfect DA's office look like to you? Mm. And that, that threw me back on my heels for a moment. Yeah. And I thought of this, I said, well, you know what, just sitting here right now, I, I have 26 prosecutors. I have three community people, and that includes the new addition with Kelly. Wow. So the perfect DA's office, if I could match the number of community people that is prosecutors yeah. and try to prevent crime, that would be the perfect DA's office. Well, a lot of what you do relies upon education. Yes. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, how you do some of that, uh, that education um, mm -hmm. in a bit. Um, can I call you Rob? Yes, please. please. All right. 
Uh, Rob, I've got a lot of things that I, 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 I want to go over with you, and I really appreciate you coming in and, and having invite. this conversation. Um, one thing I want to um, start out with, because I want to kind of address it and move on. Yep. Um, the State Ethics Commission. Yes, sir. They, um, they had um, accused you of utilizing re state resources or office resources for personal gains. Yes. Um, related to an automobile accident and then a yep. communication about housing yes. uh, through a, a donor. Um, you were fined, you paid five grand, I did. Um, and I saw in your communication, you know, uh, these aren't your words, but, oh, the book is closed, I think is what I, what I read. Kind of like, okay. we're done. Yep, yep. I have actually heard just from my contacts, and I think I even heard someone on the radio, um, uh, on the Republican side saying, this was a non-issue. This was a non-issue, but were there any, in, in their mind, I'm assuming you feel it's a non-issue, but at the same time, what are the lessons learned, boy, when you get nailed with conflict of interest? Right, definitely some learning experiences. Um, I actually appreciate you acknowledging that, uh, okay. that's, uh, that some people identify it as a non-issue. Um, I'll take it one step further, and he might be watching this at some point. Um, a, a visible face and voice uh, during the campaign for my opponent called me out of the blue two days afterwards to say, in perhaps a little more descriptive terms, what you just said. Uh, and I, I was very appreciative of that. Um, regarding the car accident, it was kind of interesting. Um, the press release, I learned literally from the Ethics Commission, if I put the word work in front of the word vehicle, that never would have been an issue. Their oh, interpretation of my press release even though I said it happened in the middle of a work day, going to a meeting, mm -hmm. because I didn't put the word work or the word official in the front of the word vehicle, there is the interpretation that it was my personal vehicle, and then therefore I was using state resources because of a personal accident, wow. which factually was not the case. Wow. Yet, yeah, wow indeed. Was that acknowledged on the ethics? Uh, on the All ethics, they were uh, interested in was the perception of the The, the optics. Yes, the Which optics. is what which I get. Conflict of interest, it's a lot about which optics. Which I get. Yeah. And then turning to the housing piece, yeah. um, candidly, I wasn't thinking, as I think a lot of your viewers and yourself may agree, there is an incredible housing crisis. Yeah. So when I was notified that, hey, um, this person has some housing options available. I just broadcast it to the staff saying, if you need, if you want to consider some housing options, I know someone I can connect you with. Yeah. That was it. Um, I learned if I had put that out on personal emails, um, then this, again, never would have been a thing. Yeah. I happened to have the personal emails from my employees because they all applied to me during the transition phase. Yeah. So again, it was just Definitely a lesson learned. So are you, you know, we like to say that the DA's office is not a political entity, mm -hmm. but you are a Democrat and yep. you ran against a Republican and yep. that was a long stronghold Republican office mm -hmm. for, for a long time. Conflict of interest yes. seems to be the way in which someone can catch someone, you know, on, right. on the opposing team. Right. How d Did this experience give you that sense of, I got to watch my back a little bit more. It, as I said, it was definitely a learning experience. Yeah. And what I really appreciate, and I, I do want to articulate, is uh, the Ethics Commission, they do their homework, they do their investigation. Yeah. I was very They are no joke. Uh, no joke at all. Yeah. Um, I, I was very appreciative that they determined, they reviewed everything. There was no uh, you know, financial gain or expected financial gain by me regarding the whole housing thing. Yeah. It was literally saying, this person over here has, has, has some housing if anyone's looking, so I really yeah. appreciated that. Yeah. As opposed to, or in regards to the politics, like I said, learning experience, and I am indeed extremely careful now. Yeah. Let's shift gears. Um, in the news right now, Mashpee, yes. mm -hmm. uh, and, and perhaps even this show would be picked up over in, in Mashpee. Um, yeah. uh, I hope it would be. Uh, on May 25th, Mashpee police learned about an assault at the high school involving yeah. two students, a 15-year-old and a 13-year-old, two mm -hmm. girls. Uh, allegedly, there was hitting. There was uh, someone got pulled into the girl, got pulled into the bathroom, yeah. forced to lick the floor. I mean, these are things that I had heard uh, uh, in, new, in news reports. Clearly, it's a, a physical violence issue. Yeah. You know, it's anger, it's physical violence, but it seeped over into this whole cyber 
uh, world because it was there was a video that was captured that went on Snapchat. That changes the the situation considerably. The victim of 15, this 15 year old girl went missing for a while. Mm -hmm. She is now safe. I'm I'm kind of uh, you know surmising all of this. The 13 year old is charged with seven counts of of um, assault and battery. Yeah. What is your involvement in this and what are the next steps as it relates to this case? So I, I know you can understand and appreciate it. I gotta be a little careful commenting because it's, it's now a pending case. Yeah. Um, I do wanna start off by uh, acknowledging and thanking Chief Carline from the Mashpee Police Department and his team, as well as we had a lot of different law enforcement agencies looking for this young girl. Yeah. Um, so I wanna recognize that and they did a great job in locating her. Um, Chief Carline and his team did work with our office trying to flush out what would it be the appropriate charges. Um, and as you just noted, they, they've been filed. Um, it's a case that we, of course, will be taken seriously because I really would like to comment on the suggested evidence, but yeah. because of the pending nature of it, I'm right. a little, I can't at the particular moment, but we have a great working relationship with uh, Mashpee PD. We appreciated them taking the time to talk to us to fashion what are, what are the charges here that should be brought because oftentimes police have to make kind of a quick judgment call and file charges pretty quickly without having the ability to talk to us. But they reached out uh, and we were really appreciative of that. If there wasn't a video, would it have been more difficult to bring charges? Uh, it, all it takes is someone, you know, witnesses, including a victim in any particular case. If they say, yeah. hey, this happened to me and, you know, we can attach credibility to what they're offering, then that's enough in and of itself to charge somebody. The town appears to be, uh, the town residents appear to be up in arms over this whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that seems to be a notion that the, the school administration isn't really acting quick enough or mm -hmm. fast enough. Uh, parents I saw on television, um, you know, after the school committee meeting, uh, they were just saying, you know, they're, they're, they're just not, they're not doing enough. Yeah. Uh, School committee vice chair after the meeting said loosely, you know, we collectively agree that we all need to talk about what to do next and we're going to do that at our next meeting. And I'm thinking, next meeting? And the superintendent has made no comment publicly or at least as, as recently as yesterday. Right. Don't they need to act faster? I mean, come on. In this situation, I'm, again, I'm grateful of the the work done by the Mastery Police Department. I, and I wanna say this, uh, we heard the outcry by the, by the public, my office did certainly, yeah. and um, we appreciate it because it, it was a horrible set of circumstances. Uh, and regarding school officials, be it on the administration side or the school committee side, I'm really not in a position to comment because I, I haven't connected with them yet. We've been focusing, working on with the law enforcement piece at this particular point. Um, as I think you know, we do go around uh, to provide certain trainings and conferences, uh, specifically in this area of, of bullying yeah. and cyberbullying and things of that sort. So um, we look to have co further conversations, uh, not just with the Mashpee uh, School Administration, but all of the schools. Yeah. Uh, and it, it just, it's, it's so fresh that I personally have had, had not had the opportunity yet to connect with the school committee. Yeah. And it's a sensitive issue because these are kids. Right. I mean, wow. these are, you have children, right? I have two children, yes. Yeah, I, I do as well. I mean, mm -hmm. good Lord. When I read that story, yeah, um, that, that's, that's frightening. Right. Let's switch gears to another happy topic. Yeah, sure. Cyberbullying. I yes. mean, here in Sandwich, it is, it is, is really just a, um, a white hot topic. Mm -hmm. um, when and how was your office brought into the incident that happened on the school bus with these kids here in Sandwich? Um, let's see, that happened if I'm uh, going for a little bit of memory, May 22, somewhere in that range, 22, 24, maybe somewhere around there. And um, I, I think coincidentally, uh, and this might have come to your attention, our office sponsored a, a cyberbullying conference, if you will, literally the week before. Uh, and that was held at Sandwich High School. And that's something, Greg, that Danielle Whitney from Sandwich, Katie Green, who's one of my community members, and um, Eileen Moriarty, who is my juvenile prosecutor, they go around throughout the entire Cape and the Islands and present these cyberbullying conferences. Uh, we promote it in whatever community that we're about to go into. Um, uh, Nobody showed up. Attendance was a little low. We, I will say we wish the attendance was a little higher. Uh, and it just happened to be 
literally about a week before the, the incident involving the baseball team. So I want to get back to my question, but I'm interested in, in that. So you have low turnout here mm -hmm. in Sandwich. Is that typical? It, it, w I will say we wish we had greater turnout in all of the communities that we, we go into. But you had like five people. It, I, my understanding of the number was five. So what does that say to you? Like, what's the, your takeaway? That, from that? well, we, we're going to continue to try to bolster our efforts to promote it so people are aware that this is going on. Um, we recognize people have busy lives. Right. You know, and many people are working two to three jobs and trying to raise a family. So yeah. the time to, you know, break off and go to a, a conference, you know, a lot of people have limited time, and we recognize that. Yeah. Uh, we want to try to make it easier for them, put it on a Zoom, things of that sort. But uh, as you might imagine, these... The topic that we're covering, the subject matter, cyberbullying, is unfortunately prevalent, not just in Sandwich, but and not just Cape Cod Island. It's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So we want to try to do what we can to try to provide parents with the information that we have to share it to try to limit instances of cyberbullying. So what is your, so you were first in, in uh, your office was first contacted, I'm assuming, by the Sandwich Police. Yeah, I believe that's, I believe that's how it played out, yes. And uh, in, 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 in late May, mm -hmm. uh, is there any involvement that your office has in this case, in this situation? Uh, yes, we did request all of the reports from Sandwich PD and Eileen Moriarty, my prosecutor, and some other folks in our office have gone through it. Um, there is a little bit of, uh, not uniqueness, but something new, if you will. Um, as you know, <laughs> there are so many different apps that you can get on your phone nowadays. Yeah. Um, and there was a particular app that was kind of new to law enforcement, uh, not just locally, but statewide, You're too. You're talking about Expose, yes, the we one were, out of France, right, I think. Right, so um, that, that was, that, that's a new one. Uh, yeah. So that's taking a little digging into to see what, what's this all about. So we're kind of in, in that uh, phase right now of learning what this app is. So do you have access to the kids' phones? Those who are on the bus, is there any of that type of investigation going Again, on? Again, as much as I would love to comment, I, I, I'm really hamstrung at, at this moment. Okay. The, um, how much are we seeing cyber bullying uh, similar to Sandwich, happen in your district, Cape and Islands? It, it, it unfortunately it happens with some frequency, honestly. Um, and this kind of dovetails into another area that I was kind of hoping we could touch upon a little bit too, is hate incidents. Uh, I, I, it, it amazes me uh, how often something's brought to my attention, and it's not high profile at all. It's just something will, will come to our attention, through, usually through schools, um, about hate incidents that are going on, and quite honestly, it's incredibly disturbing. G give me an example of, of what you're seeing by way, give me an example of what hate incidents are that you see on the Cape. Greg, it, it literally can be anything from what's going on school buses uh, to what may be written on a bathroom stall, things of that sort. Um, and it's, the volume of it is concerning to me um, to the point where uh, you know, and we'll get into this in a little bit, I think, regarding budget, certain positions that I would like to create. Um, the schools are doing what they can, police are doing what they can, but resources are definitely needed uh, to supplement the efforts that are already in place. And uh, it's somewhat of a microcosm, I think, of what's going on across the country, uh, the, the prevalence of, of hate incidents. Mm -hmm. So we're not immune to that here in the Cape and the Islands, and we're not immune to it uh, with our younger population in our schools. So um, it's something that uh, I wasn't necessarily expecting when I took this job of uh, how prevalent it is, but unfortunately it, it occurs in a volume that I really don't like. Well, and you have, um, you have the dynamics of technology that is changing. Mm -hmm. Just since you and I sat down here, right. there are three new apps that just got, you know, <laughs> uploaded. And, yeah. uh, 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 you know, the ways in which people can hack into, I mean, it's just, it's scary how it fast is. technology changes. But then you also have kids who are frankly a hell of a lot smarter than you and I yes. are yep. at what we're doing on our phones. Right. So you kind of get brought in at a point of an incident has occurred, you've been informed, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a, a criminal activity or not, it's, it's yeah. kind of that. But that education piece, mm -hmm. it's so disheartening to think that, uh, you know, I get it, people are busy, but 
when my son went into high school and we learned that he was going to eat, not in Sandwich, um, he grew up on the South Shore, um, that they were able to have cell phones on their person all mm -hmm. day long, mm -hmm. his mother and I were like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> right. We can't get him off of his cell phone at home. How are you going to do that? Right. Technology is right there in their hands. How do you, outside of these conferences, how do you deploy resources to help educate parents to say, you think you know what's going on, but guess what? You don't. So we, we try to work closely with school administrators so they could use their own personal net or their networks to get to, to parents. Mm -hmm. We try to do it directly. We try to do it indirectly through school administrators. Um, uh, last year, Greg, and, and this year, um, I am doing a little bit of a tour, if you will, giving updates to select boards in the various towns and talking to my team. We're like, we should start doing this with school committees. Yeah. So we're going to make that request to appear before school committees, and we will certainly be talking about things like cyberbullying and what our office offers to try to supplement their particular efforts. So we do it directly, and we're trying to do it indirectly as well. According to the Cyber, Secure, Cyber Bullying Research Center, mm -hmm. they define cyberbullying as when someone repeatedly and intentionally harasses, mistreats, or makes fun of another person online or while using cell phones or other electronic devices. Mm -hmm. Is that the definition, loosely, is that the definition that you use in your office to determine cyberbullying? I think loosely, yes. I think uh, our, our particular statute might be a little bit different. Um, one statute I, I'd like to try to highlight, and I, I hope I'm getting this right because I'm on camera, but um, I think it's... There's no editing. <laughs> no editing. Look no. out. Um, <laughs> I think it's New Jersey, Greg, that has a really uh, harsh or, or ch tough uh, cyberbullying and bullying law. Um, in mass, uh, we often require multiple instances before we can actually go forward with a, a harassment type of charge. And if I'm getting this right, and I hope I am, I think yeah. it's New Jersey that it's singular. Um, and that's something that I think- One and done. One and done. It's like that's, that's enough for the, for the crime. So I think that's definitely worthy of having a conversation, uh, certainly with parents and school administrators, but bringing it more to the table with our legislators yeah. um, and to see you know, if this is something we should consider uh, you know, doing here in Massachusetts. And where I go in my mind is, um, if someone assaults you, you know, that's a crime. We yeah. don't make them assault you three times. Yeah. So I think perhaps we are at that point where it, it, being bullied is so impactful and damaging to somebody yeah. that I think we need to have that conversation about bringing that number down from three to perhaps one. So you're, you're, you're using words like we need to have a discussion and, mm -hmm. and we need to consider that. But in your brain, in your mind, yep. Is it, should it be one and done? I'm leaning in that direction. I really am because now that I'm in the chair and I get to read certain reports and I've gotten to meet certain victims and seen the impact that this has had, <laughs> to, make, to require that they go through it multiple times before my office and my law enforcement partners can actually do something about it, yeah, uh, that seems well, especially seem right. here in Sandwich. I had a, 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 a conversation yesterday, a lengthy conversation with um, Heather Viola, who was the mother yeah. um, of these two kids who were victimized, and uh, and 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 that whole notion of you know her son was vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, I mean, heck, you and I were vulnerable on some levels to bullying yeah. when we were kids. Yeah. But when you are autistic, when you have significant ADHD, mm -hmm. and you hit a kid once, not right. to mention multiple times from multiple kids all sitting on the same school bus, it's disastrous. Yeah. So that one and done, um, I, you know, I think that that's probably going to be a lot of conversation. And I, uh, I, I welcome a seat at that table. Yeah, <laughs> I really do. Can a school system confiscate? Uh, phones and do a little bit of uh, analysis, forensic analysis on the spot? So, um, got to be real careful here. Okay. Okay. Um, because if there's any sort of um, direction by school officials, by law enforcement people, then we get into uh, some areas that could be problem, uh, dip, uh, difficult for us down the line trying to prosecute a case. If the school has their own policies 
that were created independently, that is without DA's office involvement, without law enforcement involvement, if they have their own policies and procedures and they proceed with their own policy and procedures and they learn of something and then bring it to our attention, that is that they're not working in our direction, then that's something that we can perhaps build off of. Okay, I see where you're, you're, okay. you're being cautious here. <laughs> yes, I am. Let, let me, let me uh, kind of come at a different angle. Uh, can schools uh, search a locker? Can they pull a backpack off oh, of a kid I, and say, I'm going the, in? Yeah, I think the, I think the laws are, uh, are there, are already established in that area that schools are empowered to do stuff like that. So wouldn't that equate to a cell phone? Um, perhaps. Perhaps, uh, and again, I, I do need to be real careful in this yeah. particular area. Um, I know schools have their own attorneys that can review governing yep. case law yep. and all that kind of good stuff. But I guess what I can offer is I would encourage school administrations to do everything that they can to ensure the safety of all of their students. <laughs> Okay, I, 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 I'm, I'm good with that. Um, you know, the, uh, when, when you look at the resources that you need, can mm -hmm. you slim down, what is it that your office needs to make sure that a situation in Sandwich does not happen again in any community? Is it people? Okay. Is it technology? Is it, what is it that you need? Um, I would start with people. And um, again, the whole uh, trying to get the information out to uh, parents and, and residents of any given town that we're about to host an event to try to provide a certain you know, educational piece for you to digest to hopefully make it easier uh, to understand cyberbullying or whatever the topic might be. Mm -hmm. um, technology, yes, we, we do use PowerPoint presentations and all of that kind of good stuff, so that, that helps. But if I, my perfect world again, if I had the ability to uh, broadcast what we're doing uh, more so people will know that it's going on, and if I had more people to do these particular presentations, that would be the perfect world. Got it. Let's switch gears. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else on Sandwich? I, I mean, it's an ongoing investigation. Right. It's, 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 you're, you're in kind of that research phase, if yeah. you will. Anything else on this case? No, and I, I just want to, I understand we're in Sandwich right now, so that's why we're focusing on Sandwich, but this is going on across the Cape and the Islands. Yeah. I just don't want to think it's unique to Sandwich. I don't want the residents feeling that yeah. way at all. But um, again, Yes, we, we're doing what we can with, with the people that we have, and we are continuing to look into the, the situation with the baseball team. Let's switch gears. Um, you and I had talked about uh, funding and your budget and yes. what you have available to you for any of these additional people and, yes. and, and resources. Uh, I'm a constituent of yours. I live in East Sandwich. Uh, how is my uh, DA's office funded, and how does it look to you, Mr. So, DA? Um, it was really interesting, Greg. The budget of the DA's office really didn't come up at all during the course of the campaign. So um, after the election's over and everyone's excited, hey, we want all that kind of good stuff, reality soaks in real fast that okay. now we got to do this. Now, right? did it not come up during the campaign because you didn't know to uh, or, or really study it or think it was an issue? I knew what it was. I knew what the dollar amount was, yeah. as, as I'm sure um, my opponent did as well. But it wasn't really so much a focus, if you will. There were so many other issues that we were focusing sure. on. Yep. So the election's over. And um, a little behind the curtain stuff, um, during the course of the campaign, I was contacted by a district attorney out in Northampton, Mass. Didn't know him, his name is Dave Sullivan. He just reached out and uh, heard about our campaign and wanted to offer some support. So I kind of described him as the DA behind the curtain during the course of the campaign. He was giving me some nice advice, so that was great. So after we won and that reality soaks in, like how do we do this now? Because now it's real and we're about yeah. to take office in about eight weeks. Um, for Jess Alumba, my first assistant, and I went out there to yeah. take a meeting and we learned something really interesting. Uh, that district is called the Northwest DA's office because it's made up of two districts, uh, our counties, Hampshire and Franklin. And they have 260,000 people uh, on an annual basis. That's almost us to a person between Dukes, Martha, uh, Nantucket, and Barnstable. We hover between 260 and 265. Curiously, our caseload is higher 
than the Northwest DA's office. So when I went out there, I knew our budget was five and a half million dollars. I learned fortuitously that his budget was $8.5 million. Get out of here. 8.5. So that's 60% more than what I have. And then I start looking at the level of services he's able to provide. And not just the additional, I think he had six more prosecutors than we do, but all the community people that he has and the resources that he can touch upon. So that drive back from the Mass Pike, coming back here, yeah. and I'm just getting to know my Cape delegation. I wasn't, I was on the phone the whole time yeah. saying, I just learned this. So <laughs> when you're sworn in in January, it's instantly budget season. The governor, I think, literally filed her budget two or three weeks after I was sworn in. Yeah. Uh, and that starts the process. So here I am, first term, not just first term, yeah. first year first term DA, yeah. saying, um, hey, me over here, I need 60% increase in my budget. You can imagine the initial reaction to that. But when we started explaining the discrepancy, yeah. it caught some attention. And uh, we did get a little bit of a bump up more than we normally would have gotten. Uh, we still have a long way to go, though. How do you get more money? What's <laughs> that process? So Crack the code for I, 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 I've learned uh, how the budget goes, so to speak, the budget process up on Beacon Hill. Um, our CAPE delegation worked really hard. I, I have to acknowledge that to try to get us more funding. Um, there's certain realities. We're competing against so many different other entities of that yeah. sort. And I happen to be the first one to bring it to their attention, this glaring difference between us and a comparable district where, yeah. you know, you, you, we try to treat people with some level of parity. Yeah. Why, we should receive what they should receive. Well, in our state representative, um, at least in the 8th district, uh, is that right? Uh, uh, we, have, so we have six state reps and two state senators. Yeah, so one of the state reps, the one that covers Sandwich, mm -hmm. uh, at least, is a big law enforcement guy, Steve yes. Gazaros. Yes, yes. Um, has he been uh, lending a voice to generate Oh, yeah, no, he, money? he has. Within the first couple of months taking office and uh, us having conversation, uh, we had a meeting in my office, and the state delegation all responded, most of them in person, some on the Zoom, and I remember Steve actually being there. Yeah. And uh, then we did it again this year, and Steve was there again. Yeah. As you and your viewers likely know, Steve is very, very much into public safety issues. Yes. So he, I know he was doing what he was what he could yeah. with the people that he knew up in Boston to try to convince them, hey, this is real. You know, yeah. we need to try to uh, bolster the, the budget for our DA so he can provide more services. It's just, it's so new up there and we're yeah. trying to- So you're gonna run again. Things. Oh, yes I am. <laughs> when, when does your term expire? Um, 2026. 2026, Jeez. so. You, you, you know, there could be a talking point if you have a challenger mm -hmm. that's going to say, is this guy getting us the money that we need? You're, you're kind of flagging, well, we're 60% behind yeah. someone that's, you know, another district. Um, so we got to get, we got to get that 60%. So I, I could say this, um, it's something I inherited from previous administration. Yeah. And um, I, I think this accurate, these numbers are accurate. Uh, after the first year of me making this noise the average DA's office got a 4.2% bump up in their budget. We got 84 wow. So, So yes, so okay. that, that's the number I'm proud of. So you moved the needle a little and, bit and, there. And we're gonna, if I can, um, <laughs> there are two particular grants that we, uh, we secured this past year too, uh, that I will actually, I'll touch upon if we move on to the human trafficking. Yeah, what, uh, yeah t tell me. Okay, um, so an area that I would love to talk about for a moment uh, is human trafficking. It's next on my list, so let's, <laughs> let's go there, sir. So, um, again, that was a topic, Greg, that really wasn't talked about at all during the course of the campaign. And how it got to my attention, candidly, was shortly after getting sworn into office, uh, there's an entity known as Cape Cod Path, uh, People Against Trafficking Humans. Mm -hmm. uh, the two women that organized it are Janice and Lois, and they've been um, working uh, this issue for, I see, four or five years at least before I came into office. And I think it was week two. They invited me to a presentation at a coffee shop in Hyannis. It was a cold Tuesday night in January. And I walk in, and there's about 20, 25 people there, uh, and one guy, uh, a big blue uniform strapping man, wound up being the chief of police, uh, Scott McDonald from Orleans. And we listened to this incredibly compelling story by a survivor, her name is Jasmine Grace, uh, of her particular experience. Mm. So I, I walk out of there that night, and I made an appointment to go see Chief McDonald down in his office a couple days later, and I just asked him, like, what brought you there that night? Yeah. And he said, Rob, I have a goal. I'm looking to launch a human trafficking task force 
with law enforcement across the Cape, and I want every single department to dedicate one officer or detective to this task force. Straight out, Greg, I was impressed, and I was inspired. Yeah, yeah. So I go back to my office, I said, what can, what can we do? Um, so we formed a civilian task force. Of course, had the uh, women from Cape Cod Path, Treasured Life Initiative over in Osterville, uh, Health Imperatives, Children's Cove, Cape Cod Healthcare, and we started doing quarterly meetings to promote awareness about human trafficking. I, I began trying to look at data and try to, uh, try to absorb all of this. So we're off and running with that. But as you know, we're a prosecuting office. So we wanted to create a prosecution unit that's never been right. in place before. Right. So speaking of the Cape delegation, we go to them in budget, and I said, this is something I'm starting to feel passionate about, and I really want to get this off the ground. They gave us the dough to hire someone. So we knew of a woman named Vanessa Mad. She was a prosecutor with the Attorney General's office up in Boston, did cases uh, all over the state. And we asked her, really, practically begged her, saying, would you come down to the Cape and help me launch this unit? And she said yes. So when she gets down here, um, she starts working with Danielle Whitney, my community programs person, and this is where I'm getting to additional funding. Um, every single year, Greg, the Massachusetts District Attorney Association had a pot of money, about a, a million dollars, that the 11 DA's offices could apply for human trafficking efforts. And the ceiling of any DA's office application was $100,000. So we said, okay, this office had never applied for it before. Danielle and Vanessa get... Wait, your office had never applied... Not once. Not once. ...for any funding towards human trafficking? Correct, sir. So um, they put the application together. We literally learn, as they're working out the application, the pot went from $1 million down to 450000 to be shared with potential 11 applicants. What is up with that? That's what I said. So again, the ceiling remained at 100. Yeah. So we put the application in. We received $97,051. Wow. Our first time we ever applied. So what did we do with the money? We took $50,000 and we gave it to an outfit called My Life, My Choice. Um, that was founded by a human trafficking survivor in Boston. And they had a Boston and a Metro Boston presence, nothing down this way. And they work with teenager and adolescent survivors from uh, human trafficking. So we brought them down. We, then, we also gave $10,000 to the Independence House in Hyannis. They work with adult survivors of human trafficking. And the balance, Greg, we gave to law enforcement partners and our own staff for training purposes. Uh, we were able to send, I think it was five people down to Dallas recently for an annual conference, uh, including Vanessa Madge and a couple other people from our office and a couple law enforcement folks. Um, and we've been putting on human trafficking trainings. Uh, we just completed our third. Uh, we did one for first responders uh, here on the Cape. We did one for the hospitality industry. And yet, just yesterday, we were over in Nantucket to do one for law enforcement over there. So we're, we're, we're getting the message out there. And if I could, um, part of what I've been doing with Danielle and some others, we are going to so many stakeholders across the district like Cape Cod Community College, Chamber of Commerce, uh, Tom Cahir, great guy over Cape Cod Regional Transit Authority, and we're asking them to help us promote awareness to it. And what we've done is we came up with a hotline, we created a QR code, we literally just got 1,000 magnets about three days ago that hopefully you and others are gonna be able to begin to see in the back of bathroom stalls, yeah. in the back of taxi cabs, uh, and the, Tom Care is generous enough to put them on the buses, and you know, if a survivor just clicks on that, yeah. or a potential survivor clicks on it and gets certain resource information, the data shows that it takes six attempts for a woman to try to leave the life. And Oof. the more we permeate the area with the options that are out there, we have a chance of lowering that number. Wow. Uh, I could do a whole show on human trafficking. I'm fascinated, and I mm -hmm. think we are so pure and clean here on Cape Cod, and then I hear human trafficking on Cape Cod. Right. I think, isn't that like a New York or a San Francisco right. thing? Or right. Uh, but it, 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 it's fascinating. Um, I, we're, we're running short on time, yes. but I, I want to talk about um, drugs. Yes. Um, since you became DA, where have you moved the needle on getting those damn opioids off the streets? So kind of curious, um, and, and I talked about this during the campaign, something that I felt that, was a, that I brought to the table was my experience in working with DA's officers off Cape, uh, as a defense attorney, of course, but I got to see what they did. Mm -hmm. And something that other DA's officers were doing 
and this district attorney's office was not doing at that time, was if someone was charged with trafficking in fentanyl or heroin or meth, things of that nature, the law allows the DA's office to move what's called for a dangerousness hearing. Mm -hmm. That is, hold that person without any bail. Mm -hmm. Keeping it real, when you're at that level, at that business of drug dealing, they prepare for the rainy day. Yeah. So they prepare for getting busted, and they you know, have their little bank account ready to, to, to pay the bails, even high bails or things of that sort. They pay the high bails, and then you know, many of them return to the life, so to speak. Yeah. This way, they're held from jump, and they don't have that a particular option. So we instituted the policy, again, this did not occur beforehand, of when people are tra charged with trafficking in heroin, fentanyl, or meth, and it's almost all fentanyl nowadays, mm -hmm. um, we seek to hold them without bail. And we are very grateful that the courts are recognizing this, and I can say the vast majority of the cases, people are being held without bail from the arraignment. And I think that's starting to make a dent. And I look at a hard number produced by Kelly Research, that's an outfit that we work with, overdoses are down 10%, non-fatal non overdoses are down 10% in 2023, or my first year in office. On the Cape. On the, on the Cape. Um, and uh, fatal overdoses were down 7%. So we think in terms of moving the needle, because of this particular tactic that we're employing, it's actually working. Uh, you know, it, it, it's frightening when you think of how much, how much drugs are on the, uh, on the streets, but there's a whole behavioral thing. It speaks to mental illness. It's, yes. I mean, it just, it just touches so much. Um, how do you navigate, how does your office navigate the whole mental illness piece into right. drugs and homelessness and there's definitely an overlap yeah. on occasion between substance abuse and, and mental health and candidly that's when we have to take a hard look and try to figure out is mental health the more driving force here yeah. and if that's the case then then we try to screen them to get them into the in the mental health court um, judge julian runs an incredible re recovery court uh, in Barnstable, Judge Edmonds over in Falmouth runs an incredible recovery court. And I, I would like to say this, um, we knew there was a need, Greg, in, on Martha's Vineyard for a recovery court, just mm -hmm. like there was in Nantucket. Um, but we were a little concerned if they had the resources, the vendors, to do a recovery court. I met with Judge Barnes, who's the presiding judge over there. He wrapped his arms around the idea, we now have a recovery court on Egertown in Martha's Vineyard. Wow, so, yeah, that's needed. Th that, was, that was needed, so we're very grateful for yeah. that. So we, we, we do have outstanding justices running those particular sessions. Um, so when we see an overlap, we, we, we try as best as we can to figure out what's more the driving force. Is it substance use or mental health? And thankfully, we have the respective specialty courts that we can divert those cases. In June uh, of 2014, there was a torso. I'm switching gears. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. I was like, wait a minute. Okay, yeah. yeah. Stay with me. Yeah, we're, I'm we're, with you, we're, right. we're, yep. we're switching gears. But a um, uh, torso of a, a black male that was found on Town Neck Beach. Uh, uh, the DA at the time, Michael O'Keefe, said that the man was likely killed somewhere else, dumped there. Uh, we've never had a, a, a closure, though there was an identity through DNA that, right. that came from this. Where are you? Is this a cold case, and where are you with it? So, um, again, shortly after we got into office, Jess Salumba, my first assistant, uh, created an unsolved homicide unit within our office, and she specifically assigned two prosecutors to every mm -hmm. unsolved. I think at the time when we first took office, Greg, I think we had nine, if I remember right, unsolved. We were able to solve one. Uh, by charging within a couple months. It was a case out of 2011 from Hyannis. Um, this particular case, I can let you know, um, Jess herself is personally on this particular matter. We have, I believe it's two state police detectives uh, that are doing an invest on it, and it is something that they meet at least monthly on. So okay. I know there's work being done. So there's work being done to figure to out To try what? to figure out identity of victim, and then of course, Beyond yeah. that. And what happened and why Town Neck Beach? And right. Well, there are a lot of open questions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, let's wrap up with this. You launched a new website. I did. Recently. I did. I'm very um, excited about it. Tell me about that. So it's been described as a, a forward facing website. You can actually interact with it. Um, I spent uh, about 40 minutes playing around with it the, when it first came out, and I couldn't get through the whole thing. Um, you and your viewers, you can sign up for uh, email notifications. Get this, texting, we could text you information if you so choose uh, to do that. And what we're really excited about too, Greg, is um, 
DA's offices, all the other DA's offices, uh, have their independent websites, uh, but it's either .org or .com. Mm -hmm. We are the first one to have a .gov. Uh, we, so we're feeling very grateful that... Uh, Why is that significant? Um, it, because I, I think generally when people go to a .gov, they attribute perhaps more credibility to what is represented. And we are yeah. trying to be really careful and so it's accurate what they were putting out, putting out there. We recognize that the pressure is on us to do this correctly. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're, we're quite excited about it. This has been um, a lot of topic, a lot of conversation, a lot <laughs> Sorry, of, a lot of ground. Rambling. No, this is, this is very good. I welcome you back and let's, awesome. let's keep conversations Definitely. going. It's Absolutely. all about safety and boy, the cybersecurity and all of these things that you just feel, how are we even gonna get our arms wrapped around yes. it? Um, we, we certainly need to. So right. thank you for your thank time. You, sir. Thank you I very appreciate much. it. I appreciate you. And you, my friends out on the Cape, I will see you soon. Thank you so much.